Hello, um, we're going to talk today in IST340 about the polymerase chain reaction. So in order to understand the polymerase chain reaction, it's helpful to review a little bit about DNA structure and DNA replication in the cell. So this is a diagram you may have seen before of uh, DNA. It's kind of a neat one. And it uh, shows that DNA is this incredible double-stranded molecule. And one of the things it shows is the complementarity between the bases. So this is the phosphate bond. This is the, the sugar molecule. This is the phosphate bond. This is the sugar molecule, phosphate bond, sugar molecule. And the base is projecting inward and forms hydrogen bonds between in this case, it's the cytosine, and this is the guanine. And in this case, it's the adenine, and in this case, it's the thymine. So there's two, two bonds, two hydrogen bonds forming between the A and the T, and there's three hydrogen bonds forming between the C and the G. And even without knowing very much about what's going on, you should be able to look at this and realize that the, the purine, or double ring molecule, that forms two hydrogen bonds must be the adenine, and the pyrimidine, which forms two hydrogen bonds, must be the thymine. The, the pyrimidine that forms three hydrogen bonds must be, must be cytosine, and the, the purine that forms three hydrogen bonds must be the guanine. So this is our double-stranded DNA molecule. And one reason I like this representation is because it shows the carbohydrate is pointing in one direction, and then on the other strand, it's pointing in the opposite direction. And so it's anti-parallel. So moving on, we'll kind of review a little bit about the biochemical mechanism of DNA replication. So DNA replication requires enzymes, and enzymes are biochemical catalysts that speed up the reaction without being consumed by the reaction. Enzymes form uh, and break covalent bonds, so they are able to reduce the amount of energy required to break bonds and form bonds. And every chemical event in the cell depends on the action of some kind of enzyme. So back in the, in the early history of understanding DNA and DNA replication, uh, biochemists made in vitro extracts. So in vitro comes from the Latin term for in glass. So biochemists would take bacteria and break them open and extract their, continent, their contents. And then they would have this gmish, this uh, mixture of all the contents of, of the cells. And they would use biochemical techniques to separate the different proteins. And they would use chromatography and different sizing gels. And they would separate all the components of the extract into individual components. And then they would slowly reassemble all the components in order to reconstruct which important enzymes m work together to make DNA work in a test tube. So Arthur Kornberg, who won the Nobel Prize for analyzing DNA replication and isolating the first enzymes that were responsible for replicating DNA, DNA polymerases, said, a biochemist devoted to enzymes could, if persistent, reconstitute any metabolic event in the test tube as well as the cell does it. So that was the idea. Take apart all the components and put them back together and see in that way which were the essential components of DNA replication. So Kornberg worked on bacteria because he figured they had to replicate DNA very rapidly because bacteria were able to replicate in 20 to 40 minutes. So whatever enzymes must be required must be present for DNA replication in simple bacterial cells. 
So he got his bacteria growing very rapidly and broke them open. And he isolated the DNA replication enzymes into different fractions. And the fractions contained more purified enzymes. And then he recombined the fractions to reconstitute the function of the, of the cell. And the fractions that were required, he then analyzed those particular fractions to identify an enzyme that he called DNA polymerase. And he concluded that what was needed was a DNA template of a single-stranded piece of DNA. And then he had to add in a synthetic primer. Uh, so in other words, the DNA had to have be single-stranded in the test tube and then have uh, a complementary strand that contained a free 3' end that extended over a template. And that was an important discovery, even without understanding DNA polymerase, because that enabled them to characterize you know, the fact that DNA required a primer in order to replicate. So the DNA, the DNA polymerase couldn't make DNA if you just gave it uh, nucleotides. So DNTPs are the deoxy nucleotides that are present. So you had to have those individual DATP, DTTP, DGTP, DCTP. You had to have all four of those present in order to replicate the DNA. So the DNA template was necessary, the primer, the polymerase, and these DNTPs. And when they were added back, then you could replicate the new growing strand of DNA. And they could tell it had replicated because they used to add some radioactive deoxynucleotides to the mix. And then they would start out with DNA that didn't contain any radioactivity. And then they would gradually get radioactive DNA that they could analyze. So they could use that as an assay. So doing this, he discovered a number of different DNA polymerases. The first one that he discovered was called DNA polymerase 1. And naturally, and the next one was po polymerase 2. And the next one was polymerase 3. So DNA polymerase 1 um, was a pretty neat DNA polymerase. It's got quite a few different activities in one single subunit enzyme. The size is about. Um, 102 kilodaltons, and it is a single monomer. There's about 300 molecules of DNA polymerase 1 per cell. So it works from 5 prime to 3 prime. It can chew back DNA. It's not just a polymerase, it's an exonuclease. So it, it contains the ability to chew back DNA from the 3 prime end to the 5 prime end. And it also contains some 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease function. And that fits with what we now know to be its cellular function, which is to repair um, and the breaks in the DNA and repair little primers that are made during replication. There's a RNA primer made, and then the RNA primers are removed by the DNA polymerase 1 and replaced with DNA. So DNA polymerase 1 then is a, a simple molecule, but essential in the cell. Um, DNA polymerase 2 is also a monomer, but used in repair, but not as, not as critical to the cell as DNA polymerase 1. And the main work of DNA replication in cells is really done by this complex um, DNA polymerase 3 which contains a wide variety of different subunits that assemble to make a really uh, high efficiency, speedy enzyme for replicating in the cell. Now, when what Kornberg showed was that when new strands are made, they are always synthesized in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And the way they, they do that is that the 5' prime triphosphate which has these three phosphates added to it, um, are added to the free 3' OH 
of the deoxyribose, which is the sugar here. And the energy for this reaction um, is generated by cleaving off this high energy phosphate bond. And then these two pyrophosphates, two phosphates together, are one of the products. And then this bond forms, which is called the phosphodiester bond. So you may wonder where the name comes from with 3 prime and 5 prime. And the answer is that when they were naming the carbon rings and the ring structures of the, the DNTPs, the first ring they named was the rings in the, in the base. And then the next rings they named were the rings in the sugar. So the base rings, the, the purine and pyrimidine rings, have already taken up the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 carbons names. So to differentiate them, they had to start with primes when they numbered the sugar that goes into the nucleotide. So this is 1 prime, this is 2 prime, this is 3 prime on the sugar molecule, which is the 3 prime end, this is 4 prime, and this is 5 prime, which has the phosphate stuck on it. So this is the 5 prime end. So when you're trying to understand the base, you're looking at this sugar, this phosphate sticking off of the 5 prime end of the sugar molecule, and the base is pointing towards the middle of the double-stranded DNA. So that's where the 3 prime end and the 5 prime end get their prime from, just for those who are always confused by why prime. Oh, this thing is taking me a minute. So why is it then that polymerases have evolved to only add nucleotides to the 3 prime hydroxyl end of the DNA molecule? And we've mentioned before that the triphosphate provides the energy for the bond that's formed between the newly attached nucleotide and the growing DNA strand. However, this triphosphate is very unstable, and it can easily break into a monophosphate and an inorganic pyrophosphate, which will float away into the cell. And at the 5' prime end of the DNA, this triphosphate uh, could break off. And so if a strand was sitting in a cell for a while, it wouldn't be able to attach a new nucleotide to the 5' prime end once the phosphate had broken off, whereas the 3' prime end only has a hydroxyl group. So as long as the new nucleotide triphosphate is carrying the triphosphate in and it's brought in by the DNA polymerase, there'll always be some energy for the new strand to continue, no matter how long the 3' prime end has remained free. So if the cell, if the DNA had evolved to have the, the phosphate groups hanging off the 5' prime end, then um, they could break off and not be usable. Whereas if you make the phosphate groups hang off of the nucleotides, if you get a, a lose your phosphate groups off of one of your nucleotides, it just won't work and you replace it with another uh, nucleotide with a 3 prime um, with working phosphate groups. So because you can only build off the free 3 prime end, that presents a problem because one strand of the double helix is running 5 prime to 3 prime and the other strand is running 3 prime to 5 prime and that's the whole business with um, being um, anti-parallel. So how can the DNA polymerase synthesize new copies if it can only travel in one direction? So in cells the DNA solves this problem by requiring a replication fork. It opens up and then it starts replicating in both directions. And one strand is replicated in short little pieces that have to be joined together and the other strand is replicated pretty much continuously. And so that strand is the one that the, the three prime end is facing right into the fork and the other strand you have to keep 
opening the fork up and then starting little short pieces that get joined together by DNA ligase. So when they're copying that template strand, here's a little diagram that shows how this works. Uh, this is the piece that acts as the primer. This is the piece that acts as the template. So the new nucleotides, deoxynucleotides, are being added, growing from the 3' end. So you say that the direction is 5' prime to 3'. Prime. They, on the other strand, they're going to be growing upside down, and you've, you're growing, again, from the free 3' prime end towards the 5' prime end. By convention, when we draw a molecule of DNA, we always put the 5' prime at the upper left, and we always put the 3' prime right below it. This side's the 3' prime, this side's the 5' prime. Now, if you happen to have an underlying template, but you don't, ha and you have some, some bonding in this fashion, and this is your 3' prime end, which your cell could do, you could have a piece of DNA that would do this, you're not going to get any extension of the nucleotides from this 3' prime end, because you have no template. So you not only have to have this, you have to have this template, and you have to have this 3' prime end in order for DNA polymerase to copy a template strand. So pretty much we knew this um, from Kornberg's work that won the Nobel Prize uh, for describing how DNA replication occurs. So the, the polymerase chain reaction is a simple technique that uses this information from the cell to amplify DNA fragments in vitro in a sequence-specific fashion. PCR is very fast, and it's very sensitive. And traditional techniques could also replicate DNA, but they required you to chop out a piece of DNA, put it into a plasmid, uh, anneal the plasmid together, transform some bacteria, um, grow the bacteria, isolate the plasmids, and then analyze the DNA that you had amplified. Whereas you can take a whole genome, add two primers that are close to one another, and that can replicate many, many copies between the two primers, and that can be performed in as little as an hour. So many biochemical analyses require that you start out with a lot of biological material, whereas PCR can, can amplify as little as a single DNA molecule. PCR has many applications in basic research. It has many commercial applications. It's used in genetic identity testing. It's used in forensics. It's used for quality control. It's used in plant and animal breeding. It's used in vitro diagnostics, and it's used in research very often. So it's a, it's a great technique. It was invented by Kerry Mullis, and it was considered such an important breakthrough that he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1993. And he was thinking about how to replicate DNA and, and analyze it better, and he was driving along, um, by his story, he was somewhat under the influence of hallucinogenic drugs, and he was driving a particular windy road um, in La Jolla, California, on the way to work, and going back and up and down on the switchbacks of the road led him to think about how the DNA unwinds and replicates, and he came up with the idea of putting these two primers together to make targeted replication of only a portion of the DNA. So what PCR that does then is target a specific subsequence to be replicated in a larger DNA molecule. And because you're replicating it, each time you replicate the DNA, you replicate all the DNA you replicated from the previous time you replicated the DNA. So that each PCR cycle can theoretically um, 
double the amount of DNA from the first cycle. So if you started out with two copies, the next cycle you'd have four copies, and then eight copies, and so on. So during PCR, an existing DNA molecule is used as a template to synthesize the new strand. And through repeated rounds of DNA synthesis, you make a large amount of DNA. So it's, it's based on understanding DNA replication. And uh, another scientist who also won the Nobel Prize, um, Sanger, uh, figured out how to use DNA replication in a primer to do DNA sequencing. And so Kerry Mullis's invention came about by putting two primers together to replicate DNA in a specific way. Um, so Kornberg knew you could replicate it in a test tube. Um, Sanger figured out a way to replicate with one primer and make one strand of DNA that you could sequence. And then Kerry Mullis found you could take two primers, point them towards what, their three prime ends, towards one another, and then replicate all the DNA between the two primers. Now the, the first primer, the first polymerase that uh, was used in PCR was that original Kornberg E. coli DNA polymerase 1. And the problem was that came from E. coli, which aren't very thermal stable. So every time you did a cycle of heating, you wound up killing the polymerase. So one of the contributions of PCR was the original PCR didn't use thermostable polymerases, but subsequently they were added, and adding them made it really practical. Because after, when you use a thermostable polymerase, you didn't have to add fresh polymerase to every cycle. So I'm going to um, jump here to a nifty website from the DNA Learning Center. And it contains an animation of PCR that I find really helpful for explaining it. So I'm going to go through and follow this step-by-step -step amplification method. So in PCR, in the test tube, you've got all the components for DNA replication. And we'll go through them in a, in a little bit. And what you do is first you heat your DNA to melt it so that the hydrogen bonds are held together energetically in the cell. And you can, you can break those hydrogen bonds by adding energy by heat. And so when those hydrogen bonds are broken, then they're single-stranded, and primers can be added. So what you do is you lower the temperature and allow hydrogen bonds to form between the primers. So symbolically on this diagram, there's a little ball in the red primer, and there's a little ball in this primer. Those little balls represent the five prime end of the primer. So this is the five prime end of the primer, which is sometimes called the upstream primer. And this is the five prime end of a primer that's sometimes called the downstream. So this is also sometimes called the forward primer, and this is sometimes called the reverse primer. This strand is the sequence of this strand above it. And it's complementary to the strand below it. This one is equal to, it, it contains the same sequence as this strand, and it's complementary to this strand. So I always tell my students when they're designing a primer that this is the top left and this is the bottom right. So when, the, when you've got it at a good temperature for hybridization, these primers then form stable hydrogen bonds. And then the next step is to raise the temperature at, to 72 degrees for a few minutes. And this allows the TAC DNA polymerase to attach and extend. So now I'm going to click Extend. And the TAC DNA polymerase jumps onto the free 3' end and replicates the DNA along the template. 
So at this point now, we've got a primer end that's defined because you can't, that particular strand, we know which end it is. And this particular strand, we know which end this one is. The, this is the original template, and it remains in the test tube. So now what we're going to do is go through another cycle of heating, annealing, and uh, heating. So the first heating temperature is the denaturing or melting of the DNA. The next step is the annealing or hybridization of the primers. So again, the primers are coming in there, finding their complement, and then we raise the temperature a little bit to get a temperature that the TAC DNA polymerase enjoys, and then it's going to hop on and extend. Now, if you look at this cycle, what you'll see is that this strand that has been replicated has two defined ends. This end is defined by the primer, and this end is defined by this primer because that's where it ends. It, there's no more template once you get to the five prime end of this strand. Now, the same th thing is not true for these two strands. They, we don't know exactly where they're going to end. There's only a short amount of time for them to replicate, but they're going to be longer than this strand. This one, the polymerase ran out of DNA template to copy. So in cycle two, we have some that are going to go on to make defined ends. So in cycle three, for the first time, we go do our melting, we add our primers, we extend our primers, and now we see these short pieces that have two defined ends being complete short molecules. So we have a mixture then of the original template, which is longer, and then we have these strands that are somewhat longer. They, they have a defined, one defined end from the primer, but they end at different lengths, and then we have in there two molecules out of this group of eight that are the short molecules. Sometimes these are called amplicons. So now we're going on to the fourth cycle, and we're not going to keep heating and melting, but we're going to look at the final products. And here we see that now we've got a group of eight products that are shorter. And if we go on to the fifth cycle, we're going to see that we have a group of 16 products that are shorter. And so what happens is every time we're replicating, these, rep these short products become the template for replication, along with the original longer pieces of DNA that were in there. And so all of the double-stranded DNA has the same sequence. So now we're going to look at a graph, which will help us see how this doubling winds up being uh, an exponential thing. So here we've got an exponential graph on the y-axis, and we're comparing the number of cycles. So when we do the first cycle, we're copying the DNA, but we're not necessarily getting those short pieces that in this graph are called the target copies. The second cycle, we still don't have any targets. And when we get to the cycle three, we've got two targets that are copied. So we go on to cycle four, we've got eight target copies. And then we go on to cycle five, and now we've got 22 target copies. So we keep increasing the number of target copies. And as we go along, what you'll see is that there's the, the difference between the DNA copies total and the ones that are the short target copies kind of decreases because more and more of the templates are the short copies that have been amplified. So if you started out with two copies after the first cycle, then the next cycle would be um, two to the second power 
then the one following it would be 2 to the third power, 2 to the fourth power, 2 to the fifth power. So finally you get to 2 to the tenth power, and if you do all your exponents on that, you'll find that's 1024. So you can use the cycle number as your exponent over 2 to figure out how many DNA copies total are present after a certain number of cycles. So let's just continue our cycles up to cycle 20 here. And at cycle 20, we've got a, approximately a million copies. And there's not very many, relatively speaking, of the longer DNA copies. We really have done a lot of catching up here. So there's about 40 copies that are DNA in total, and then the rest are these shorter copies. So let's go on and look at the amplification, and you can see the later cycles, there's a lot more amplifying going on. And when you get to cycle 28, now you've got a quarter of a billion, now you've got half a billion at cycle 29, and then by cycle 30, you've got a billion. So that's a lot of replicating to go forward. So, as I mentioned, it's, it's important to understand what's in the tube and what's going on. So, just like in the Kornberg DNA experiments that he used with extracts, he had to have, for his extracts to work in his test tube, all four of the deoxynucleotides. And he had to have some DNA polymerase enzyme. Because we're using thermocycling, um, with a, a thermal stable enzyme, it's preferable to have uh, one that can doesn't have to be replaced at every cycle. So, as I mentioned before, this is a polymerase one type of enzyme, uh, not a polymerase three type of enzyme. So you need target DNA. That target DNA can come from a genomic DNA. It could come from a clone you could synthesize some DNA and then amplify it. So there's lots of ways you can get the target DNA. And you have to have the DNA primers. Those are short, chemically synthesized DNA that are complementary to the target DNA. And we make those short primers chemically using a machine. You need some buffer that will keep the pH at the correct, um, the correct pH for the enzyme to maintain its proper configuration. If the pH is too low or too high, the DNA um, polymerase will somewhat denature and it won't be a very effective enzyme. Its, its bonds will fall apart. The magnesium chloride is contained as part of the active site of the DNA polymerase. So all the enzymes that are breaking in, and forming these phosphodiester bonds, so restriction enzymes, DNA polymerases, um, all kinds of enzymes that break and form phosphodiester bonds require um, magnesium chloride. And they also require the energy from uh, a phosphate bond breaking. And so that phosphate bond then um, it's, it's contained in the deoxynucleotides. So the primers are very critical. They define the DNA sequence that's going to be amplified. So if you have 3.3 billion base pairs in the human genome and you want to amplify 100 base pairs of that genomic DNA, you want to find two primers that are complementary 100 base pairs apart that one is complementary to the top strand and one is complementary to the bottom strand so that it runs with three prime ends running towards one another. So those primers then are going to bind to the DNA template and they act as the starting point for the DNA polymerase because as we mentioned earlier talking about rules of DNA replication in the cell that you can only extend an existing DNA molecule and it's incapable of initiating DNA synthesis without a primer being present. 
So the distance between the two primers determines the length of the newly synthesized DNA molecule. So it's the DNA polymerase is going to add a single deoxynucleotide triphosphate complementary to the existing strand, chuck down one, add an, the next complementary one. So, and that deoxynucleotide is added to the, to the free three prime end of the growing strand so the DNA synthesis can occur in the five prime to three prime direction. And the sequence then is going to be complementary to the template strand. So this is looking in closer detail at this. So we've denatured the DNA by heating. And when I first heard about PCR, I was always puzzled by it. I mean, we read the original PCR paper that was published and we all looked at it and I went, I don't get it. I don't understand why the DNA strand doesn't just slam shut and stably stay shut as soon as it hits the temperature for annealing the primer because the you get a much stronger hydrogen bond between longer pieces of DNA than between short pieces of DNA. That was something we knew from um, doing DNA sequencing with one primer. We knew that we had to heat the DNA to make it single-stranded with primer present and then we would gradually cool the DNA so that the hybridization could occur between the primer and we were always worried that the whole thing would slam shut. And the reason it works is that you have many more fold excess primer than target DNA. So you have a lot more moles, um, 10 to the minus 12th moles of primer, whereas the template is at 10 to the minus 20th moles of template. So you're operating at 100,000 fold excess. So you have a lot more primer. So that means even though it is true that the two strands slamming shut will form a more stable hybrid, those little pieces get in there and can form a, a complementary hydrogen bond because there's so many of them relative to this strand finding its exact complement. So once they have, once you lower the temperature to the, the correct temperature for the hydrogen bonding to occur with the primers and the template, then um, you've got free three prime ends that are facing each other that can be extended. So um, it's very important to pick the right temperature for this to occur. And at 55 degrees centigrade, about 18 nucleotides of primer in length will efficiently form a hydrogen bond to a DNA template. So the adjustments in temperature and time um, can be made to take into account whether or not the primer is got lots of G's and C's in it because the GC pairs have three hydrogen bonds and so they form a more stable hybrid. The AT pairs have only two hydrogen bonds so they form a less stable hybrid. So you want a lower temperature when you have primers with lots of AT pairing going on and you want a warmer, higher temperature when you have primers with lots of GC primer pairing going on. So I always think of the hybridiz hybridization temperature as being uh, similar to an organic chemistry exam. If you make the exam too easy, everyone passes, everyone gets a hundred, and the teacher has no idea what anybody knew. Uh, if everybody gets a hundred, then you can't tell whether or not some people studied harder. It was too easy. But if you make the test too hard, no one passes. And then you can't differentiate between people who studied and didn't study because everybody fails. So you want the temperature to be able to differentiate between the, the correct primers and can, and if it's the right temperature, you won't get false priming. So if the temperature is too low, the primer will form weak hybrids 
with all kinds of regions with partial complementarity. When the temperature is just right, uh, you get complete complementarity. And when the temperature is too high, the hydrogen bonds are unstable and you don't get any complementarity. And there's no PCR that occurs at all. So you get a false negative in that experiment. So as I mentioned, longer primers can form more stable hydrogen bonds. The ones with high GC can bond at higher temperatures and high AT can bond at lower temperatures. So there are differences between PCR and in vivo DNA replication. The double-stranded DNA template doesn't require in the cell that it be completely denatured into single strands. So that in the cell, there's all kinds of uh, single-stranded binding proteins, and there's DNA gyrase and DNA helicase and topoisomerases that are basically pulling apart the strands, unwinding the strands, clipping the strands to let them unwind, and then putting s torque back into the, the system so that it, you get the correct uh, torque on the, the double-stranded molecule. So you don't need a primase to make an RNA primer to prime the DNA replication either, since in the PCR reaction, you're providing the primers that you need. And you don't need special sequences to tell you where to start or stop DNA replication in the cell. You can use any primers you want, and that'll be where DNA replication starts. So we have a whole technology to do this using uh, instruments called thermocyclers. And they have a heat conducting block, or sometimes they have tubes that are in a, a like a hot air blower that'll change the temperature really fast. And those blocks will change the reaction temperature. And so they've got a little uh, program that you can enter to maintain the appropriate temperature for the required length of time for each step of the cycle. You put your mixture of all six reagents into the reaction tubes. You put them inside the thermocycler, and then that heats and cools the heat block to achieve the necessary temperature inside the tubes. And when you program the thermocycler, you specify a series of temperatures and times. You start out with usually a slightly longer melt temperature uh, and time. So you melt maybe at 94 degrees for two to four minutes. That's because you've got genomic DNA many times. And the genomic DNA are long pieces. They get broken up a, a little during DNA extraction, but they're usually over 20,000 base pairs. And so it takes a little longer to melt them and then the primers find their way in. And then you go through and extend it uh, for the right temperature for a, a given amount of time. So in this cycle, every, every cycle, you're going to heat it to 94 degrees for 30 seconds, lower the temperature to 55 degrees for 30 seconds, and then raise the temperature back up to 72 degrees. That's the temperature the polymerase really likes for 60 seconds to give it time to extend completely. Then you're going to have another cycle of 94, 55, 72. Another cycle of 94, 55, 72. And you specify the number of times this cycle is repeated. So you may specify 30 times, you may specify 35. Some cycles are 40. So the, each of these repeats then is called a cycle. At the end, I usually add a 10 minute cycle at 72 degrees. After I've done all this, this repeating cycles, I add one more 10 minute cycle at the end. And that's because to fully extend the products of the last round of amplification you want to give the polymerase a little more time because there's a lot more molecules that need to be fully extended. So if you're looking at PCR then, you can look at uh, an example here. Here's a, a strand of DNA and here's a primer. So if you're putting this strand in, 
how long will be the first strand that's replicated? So the answer is, if this is 32 nucleotides long, here is where the primer is, and it extends all the way down here, so it's 30 bases long. This is a trick question for students because they forget that the primer becomes part of the replicated piece of DNA. They look at it and they start counting here, and so they they mistake how long the replicated piece of DNA is. The primer gets included in the DNA that's replicated. Likewise, if this is the second strand and the second primer is added, now you've got this as the replicated piece, and this piece comes in and gets extended. Now it's 25 bases on this strand. So this 5 prime end is going to s define where this strand gets copied, and it ends up here. So if you look at them together, you find out that the amplified piece is 25 nucleotides long. So when you're designing PCR, many times you're given the reaction uh, temperature cycle that you need to use and the primers that you need to use. But somebody had to figure out what those cycles and primers were. So the way you figure them out is uh, to design some primers, look at the primers and figure out what their melting temperature should be, and then do a series of experiments to determine uh, what the optimum concentration of various components of the reaction are. So the things you want to optimize or change in a series of experiments to improve the replication are things like magnesium concentration, the temperature you anneal the primer at, the, how you design the PCR primers. If the first time you do it the PCR doesn't work, maybe you might want to redesign your primers. Um, the DNA quality can be optimized and the DNA quantity can be optimized. You can optimize the DNA polymerase concentration. You can optimize the concentration of primer. You can optimize the reaction buffer composition. Um, there are quite a few different buffers that can be used with polymerases, different polymerases that can be used. And so you can optimize which polymerase you choose to use as well. Um, you can optimize the extension time. Maybe longer extension time is better. Maybe shorter extension time is better. Um, you can add some supplements besides the original six ingredients that I want you to be able to remember for the test. Um, and you can add bovine serum albumin. You can add non-ionic detergents. One that's popular is Nonadet P40 was in the original PCR experiments. You can add a carbohydrate called betaine. You can add ammonium sulfate. There's a lot of additives. Um, some people add a variety of different additives to make the PCR more specific, to help especially if there's GC rich regions, or to help if there's um, kind of DNA that's not very pure. Sometimes adding some additives can make up for that. But if you do all this optimization and your PCR still doesn't work, maybe you want to redesign your primers or repurify your DNA template to eliminate inhibitors that could interfere with the amplification. But um, a lot of times it's really just a case of tweaking the reaction until it works. So if your PCR conditions aren't optimal, aren't optimized, then you can get very low yields of PCR product. Um, you may not, you may be able to get amplification if you put a lot of DNA in, but low amount of DNA won't amplify. And frequently we want to study low amounts of DNA, especially for things like forensic analysis. Um, and you can amplify undesirable PCR products non-specific amplification. Instead of getting a nice band on a gel, you wind up getting a big smear on the gel. 
Um, and you can get some uh, PCR amplification of the primers, amplifying the primers without amplifying any of the target DNA. And that's referred to as primer dimer formation. So we don't want any of those non-optimal problems. So that's when you're going to try and optimize your reaction. So one of the key things to optimize is magnesium concentration. So the you do have to optimize the magnesium concentration using standard conditions. So you'll work up standard conditions of primers, templates, DNA polymerase, deoxynucleotide concentration, and then you'll set up a series of reactions where everything is the same but you add increasing amounts of magnesium. So um, you'll increase those magnesium concentrations by 0.5 to 1 millimolar in the reaction and then you'll do PCR at the same cycle, take the amplification products out, run them on a PCR gel, and then look at the products and try and figure out which one has the single band of the right size without a lot of smearing and that will be the DNA magnesium concentration that you want to use. If there's too little magnesium, DNA polymerase has low activity. But if there's too much magnesium, then that facilitates binding of it, it lowers the temperature required for binding. It acts like a salt to stabilize the hydrogen bonds and um, you'll get nonspecific amplification. And when you get less specificity in your priming, you're going to have also potentially um, too many smeary bands and you'll also get less fidelity of the DNA polymerase itself and you'll get a higher error rate in your replication. So you don't really want too much magnesium. So a lot of the time in lab I use Promega Mastermax and that has kind of a, a standard concentration of 1.5 millimolar magnesium. And it's really quite easy to add additional 25 millimolar magnesium chloride to the reaction and bump up that titration of magnesium in replicates as you go through and figure out if you need more magnesium. There are a variety of different polymerases with different capabilities that you can use in your DNA replication PCR experiments. The most common one is Thermus Aquaticus or TAC DNA polymerase and that has a range of 1 to 4 millimolar magnesium chloride as its optimum. The one I also use is a PFU DNA polymerase. PFU um, often uses a higher amount of magnesium. It uses magnesium sulfate and we like PFU because it has proofreading capability. So it's able to notice mismatches in the replication and fix them. So it's got the ability to correct mistakes it makes. Whereas TAC has very good processivity. It replicates the DNA very quickly, but it doesn't know when it's made a mistake. So if you make a mixture of PFU and TAC, you get the best of both worlds because you get the processivity of the TAC DNA polymerase and the PFU plots along, but it notices that the TAC has made some mistakes and it goes in and fixes them. So these other polymerases are also variously good processivity or good proofreading. So the temperature that you pick for that middle temperature, that annealing temperature, is the, the temperature that is also really critical to optimize. And as I mentioned before, it depends on how long the primer is and what its nucleotide concentration is. And one thing you get when you order the primers is they'll, they'll give you um, the melting temperature or TM of the primer. And so usually the optimal annealing temperature is within 5 degrees centigrade of the melting temperature of the PCR primer. 
So if they tell you that the melt, the TM of the primer is 56 degrees, then the optimal annealing temperature is going to be somewhere between 51 degrees and 61 degrees. And so the TM is the temperature at which 50% of the complementary DNA molecules will be double-stranded. So half the DNA will be melted and half the DNA will be unmelted at that temperature. So that's a, that means you can form a reasonably large number of stable primer hybrids with the DNA. So it's very important for both primers in your primer pair to have a similar uh, annealing temperature because if one is very low and the other one is very high, you have to use the low temperature. And then the, the primer that is um, that requires the high temperature will work at the lower temperature, but it might also find some mismatches that it works at equally well and you won't get very good specificity. Now in forensic DNA we often amplify lots of sets of primers. So we can do 12 or 16 or 20 different sets of primers in one tube and that's called multiplex PCR. So when you're doing multiplex PCR with a single PCR reaction all the primers have to have similar annealing temperatures. Um, so when you've got the right temperature, the primer only binds to its complement and not to mismatched sequences. If you pick a primer that has multiple complementary sequences because you have a primer that has, you maybe there's replicates of that gene within the genome, you're going to get multiple bands. So you do have to know a little bit about the genome that you're looking at in order to understand what, what result you're going to get with a given primer. So you need to run a little experiment. So you make about 10 tubes of PCR with identical reagents in them and you put them in the thermocycler and you program the thermocycler to have a gradient across the, the temperatures. And then you see, you take the tubes, you run the products of the tubes on a gel, and you look to see which temperature had good amplification. And you pick the lowest temperature, or the highest temperature that works, because the higher the temperature, the more specific it should be. And so the, the highest or second highest temperature that works is usually the best one to pick. Many of the problems of PCR are avoided by having good primers. And ideally, all the primers should have similar melting temperatures, and that's achieved by having similar GC content, since the GC content predicts the melting temperature. And but when you're looking at your primer pairs, their melting temperatures can be in the range of 45 to 70 degrees centigrade. Sometimes people use primers that are not a perfect match. Sometimes they use conserved primers across a variety of species to amplify the DNA in a, C in a species about which we know nothing about its DNA. So recently there was a, um, a new species described of some kind of little carnivore in um, that, that lives nocturnally in South America. And this little carnivore was very similar to, but not identical to in appearance, to um, uh, another carnivore. And they thought they were all in the same species. And then somebody started analyzing their DNA and they realized that there were at least 10% differences in the DNA sequence of this other group of carnivores and they realized that they were two different species. And so they were using the primers from one species and they could use them in the second species. When you're using primers that are similar but not identical, you actually want to take advantage of a lower temperature so that you do tolerate some mismatches. 
And as I mentioned, it's ideal to have about 50% GC content. That's, that's a good way to, to do it. So you want to pick primers that don't have a lot of intramolecular or intermolecular secondary structure. We don't want them to form little knots. We don't want them to form little hairpin loops. We don't want them to twist around. And we really don't want them to form complements between two primers or within a primer, because then what might happen is that the primer itself will replicate the primer. So how do we figure out how to design a primer? We use software. And there are software packages and websites to design the primers. So I mentioned that you can get complementarity between primers. In this case, we've got a little complementarity going on at the three prime end of the top primer and the bottom primer. And because there's a little bit of complementarity, it can extend using this primer as the template instead of finding its hydrogen bond with the genomic DNA that's in the test tube. Now, there's not really a lot of complementarity there, um, maybe a few bases of complementarity, but they're right at the three prime end. And as a result, um, there's so many copies of the primer compared to the template that even though the, the primer would have a better pairing with the template than it would with itself, the numbers game works against you here. So you get replication then. So when you, what does primer dimers look like? Well, on a gel, what you'll see is a band that's very small. So this is a ladder of known DNA sizes. This is 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 base pairs. The product they want is up here around 700 to 900 base pairs. And the product they're seeing is less than 100 base pairs. So that's probably primer dimer. These are some links to some primer software that I've used successfully. Um, I've used the Primer 3 software. Um, I Sometimes I'll design primers myself, and then I'll put the primers into a website that IDT DNA offers. IDT DNA is a seller of primers, and they you can put the primer you've designed yourself into their software, and it'll tell you if it's got complications when it works with itself. And the NCBI um, genome database also has primer design software that you can use for free. The NCBI is the home of all the genomic sequences that are freely accessed on the internet. So the human genome is available for you to design primers for. And I've done that with NCBI software, and it works really well. So you need good quality DNA. I think I've mentioned that before. It should be intact. It shouldn't be all broken up. Lots of things will break the DNA up. Um, if you have DNA that's, from a, that's been in a fire, or DNA that's been ex out for exposed to the elements for a long time, uh, if you have DNA that's been in tissues that have degraded, uh, like a cadaver, then the enzymes in those tissues are going to break up the DNA, and it's going to be very hard to purify intact DNA from that. So you need, uh, hopefully, fresh DNA. Um, Sometimes the contaminants come from the surface where the DNA is. Um, if there's, if you purify uh, it from heme from blood or humic acid from soil, when you're purifying DNA from hair, you can get melanin. When you have plants, I've purified carbohydrates with the DNA, and they'll inhibit all kinds of things. So contaminants are either in the original um, source from which you're getting it, or they can be introduced during the purification process. We use phenol and ethanol and sodium to desyl sulfate and detergents and salts to purify the DNA. And if too many of those things remain in our DNA, 
they can inhibit our PCR reaction. So one way you can find out that the DNA quality is the issue is if you find you get better amplification when you add less DNA instead of more DNA. So less, more DNA is not always the solution. Um, high molecular weight DNA, as I mentioned, is preferred. Um, one way to find out you've got high molecular weight DNA after you've purified it is first you figure out your quantity using a spectrophotometer, then you run a gel on it. So on this gel, this is what good high molecular weight DNA looks like. There's um, a large DNA, very large pieces stick in the well of the agarose gel, and then these pieces are pretty big, and there's a few degraded pieces here. These two samples have a little more sample degradation, but there's still quite a bit of high molecular weight DNA. This sample doesn't have any high molecular weight DNA, and it's more degraded. So this one would be less preferable for amplification. It, one reason that we do only about 30 or 40 cycles instead of continuing to cycle and cycle and cycle is that over time the genomic DNA will start breaking due to DNA heating. So over time the, the actual template begins breaking down as you heat it. Some of the DNA purification methods that we're going to use involve heating the DNA um, and we don't want to heat it at very high temperatures for a long time because then the DNA will be more degraded. The quantity of DNA is also important to optimize. Um, there's a temptation for people who first start out to add more template, but more template is not necessarily better. In fact, too much template can cause nonspecific amplification and a lot of problems. Of course, too little template and you're not going to get any PCR or very little PCR. So uh, the amount, optimal amount of template depends on the size of the DNA molecule. So if you have a really small genome, you can add less template and get the same number of copies of the material that you want to amplify. If you have a really huge genome, you need to add a little more DNA in order to amplify a, DNA, a gene from the genome. So I'm going to end with a funny video that was made by a manufacturer of thermocyclers. And so it's based on the, it's a really a, a commercial for DNA thermocyclers. And of course it didn't run on television, it ran on YouTube. And they put a link up and they were doing a, a, a mockumentary of of the song that was that was done for raising funds um, for individuals, so it, it's a funny funny video. So we'll watch it. It's a YouTube. Jim and John are both covered by the nation's best networks. Sorry for the commercial. Jim uses Intellos Wireless. There was a time when to amplify DNA You had to grow tons and tons of tiny cells Ooh, And along came again in Dr. Carey Morris Said you can amplify in vitro just as well Just mix your tablet with a pulper The times and for here and too. The nature ring and kneeling and extending. Well, it's amazing what heating and cooling and heating will do.
scientists out there doing PCR, BioRad salutes you with the all-new 1000 series thermal cycling platform. Enjoyed this and I hope it actually recorded this time.